W-H-I-R-E. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. I'm Stephen Spatz, Assistant Outreach Librarian, and on behalf of the staff of Falvey Memorial Library and Library Director Mini. Joe Lucia, I'd like to welcome you to this afternoon's event, uh, a faculty book talk featuring Hispanic and Cultural Studies Professor Dr. Sylvia Nagisekmi. Before we begin, I'd like to mention a couple events still to come this semester here in Falvey Library. On Wednesday evening, November 16th, 2011, at 7 p.m., the Manila Distinguished Speakers Series continues with Dr. Joan Severino, who will present a lecture entitled Embroidery as Inscription in the Life of a Calabrian Immigrant Woman. And on Thursday afternoon, December 1st at 4 p.m., the next edition of our Conscience of the Holocaust Lecture Series will take place, featuring a lecture by Dr. Cheryl Perlmutter Bowen entitled Transcending Trauma, Female Communication in Holocaust Survivor Families. Look for information on these and other library events on our website and social media sites, on posters and banners designed by Joanne Quinn, or on MyNova Campus Currents and other campus news outlets. <laughs> Falvey Memorial Library is delighted to welcome back Dr. Sylvia Nagisekmi on the occasion of the publication of her latest anthology, Perennial Empires, Postcolonial, Transnational, and Literary Perspectives. As most of you already know, Dr. Nagi Sekmi is Director of Graduate Hispanic Studies and Director of the Cultural Studies Program here at VU. She organized last, last month's conference honoring the centenary of uh, Peruvian author Jose Maria Ar Arguelas, and she's published a sizable body of articles and edited volumes dealing with topics in post-colonial studies. In her latest offering, uh, which is a continuation of uh, a previous anthology entitled Colon Colonization or Globalization, Dr. Nagi Sekmi and co-editor Chantal Zabu explore the persistence of colonial discourses in today's world through examples of writing back, views of the legacy of empire from the perspective of the ones colonized. Please join me in welcoming back to Falvey Memorial Library, Dr. Sylvia Nagi Sekmi. Hi, good afternoon, thank you for coming. Thank you for the kind presentation. I would, I would like to express my appreciation to uh, Falvey Library to uh, keep inviting me back. And uh, I really uh, would like to thank all of you to, for being here in spite of everybody's very busy schedule. This is, you know, before Thanksgiving is the worst possible time uh, for everyone, including me. But um, I am really pleased that, that you all came, and I'll try not to disappoint you. Um, Post-colonial and transnational studies seem to be everywhere these days. So what is timely about this topic? Um, many decades after the official end of empire, which means the liberation of uh, colonized countries in the 70s, 80s, uh, there was a wave of uh, uh, colonized, uh, I'm sorry, colonizing countries that uh, sort of uh, allowed independence of colonies in Africa, in, in uh, uh, different parts of uh, the world. But it is still the case that uh, the liberation of colonial, colonized states um, did not yield a substantial um, development in those countries. They still suffer from the ills of corruption, disorganization, lack of basic institutions, and alike. These are the so-called experimental nation, and this is a term coined by Reda Bensmaya, who is a Maghrebi uh, US-based uh, author and professor and critic. He describes with these uh, words, the post-colonial countries that carry the heavy burden of colonial legacy, namely an economic, political, legal, and moral system imposed by colonizing nations. It is important to make a link between this chaotic reality and the colonial legacy, otherwise we will be led to think that this inequality is somehow the result of European and Western superiority. If you think about the Ideology, uh, ideology of the colonizing um, efforts, which is the civilization, you know, the civilizing mission. And uh, that is what I'm talking about, <coughs> which assured a discursive um, 
uh, vicious circle that justified colonization uh, in a way. The survival of the autocratic order and the hegemonic discourses that supports it inspired the volume <coughs> edited by Chantal Zabu, uh, professor and uh, endowed chair of uh, English and women's studies, uh, gender studies at the uh, Sorbonne University. Um, our work draws on the critical theories advanced by Edward Said, Antonio De Negri, and Michael Hart. <coughs> in the introduction of this book, in a, we, we came up with a clearly Hobbesian reference. We used the metaphor of Leviathan, Leviathan as a, um, to describe the tentacles of empire that reach all corners of the world. What we mean by that is that uh, empires officially say, cease to exist with the, with the liberation of uh, colonies. However, they have been recreated and they resurfaced and reemerged in different shapes and forms. Um, the, the, there are two volumes here in question. The first one is was uh, this one, Colonization and Globalization. This was published in 2009, also with Chantal Zabu. We did a collection of articles um, that were uh, dealing with the post-colonial exploration of the imperial expansion. Uh, which is, excuse me, I have to, okay. Uh, this volume was, thi uh, the thinking behind this volume was whether colonization and globalization could be either equated or somehow related or linked together in, in a, any way or shape. Um, it was examining mostly empire as part of modernity. It concentrated in the colonization in its classical phase, which is uh, this civilizing mission that I was talking about. <coughs> However, the perennial empire is talking about these new modes of empire building that are no longer tied to colonization in a classical sense. You know, it's not done with armies. And, and with the <coughs> cross in the hand, but it is done with IMF loans and, and with the different uh, maneuverings of uh, world finances, for example, as we see it now uh, developing. <coughs> the book, this one, offers examples of post-colonial representation of empire in the modality of writing back, as my kind uh, uh, introductor mentioned it. Um, which is to say from the perspective of the ones colonized. Uh, the articles that deal not only with the reality of ex-colonies and their spaces, but also describe the consequences of colonization in the so-called mother countries or ex-mother countries, such as England, France, Spain, and Portugal. This is important because we have the impression that uh, colonization has only an effect on the country to be colonized. But it does have an effect uh, on the colonizer countries, especially in a post-colonial era. Think about the Pakistani population in England, or think about um, the Maghrebi population in, in France and Belgium and Holland. Uh, it is what uh, the what I used to call the post-colonial gurus, Bill uh, Ashcroft and. Um, Garrett Griffith and Helen Tiffin used to term the writing back. Where back to? The writing back could occur from the ex-colonies, meaning countries of Africa, Latin America, etc. But it could also occur on the soil of the so-called mother countries. Uh, on, um, it is very interesting because it has this aspect of uniting this uh, colonization and the aftermath of colonization. I mean, it's, it, it is not separate. The colonizing and the colonized are ever united in, in this uh, uh, condition. 
falling into four parts. This book examined how, examines how hybridity and transculturation may be reconceptualized in a post-colonial framework and how this approach may contribute to a deeper understanding of the historical and literary manifestation of empire and nation building that provides the context for the scrutiny of national identities and imageries. The volume aims at deconstructing the modernist and post World War idea of the nation, as it is in the works of uh, Siebold, Joseph Conrad, Virginia Woolf, and Peter Rushforth, as a site of purity and alterity. Um, this is. Uh, um, this is important because colonization, especially European colonization, uh, has been built upon this ideology of the difference. Alterity has been defined as the reason for colonization, meaning that um, European superiority was guaranteed by race and this racial difference uh, because it was declared that uh, people of different races would be inferior because they were not civilized. And uh, this uh, became the justification of this uh, colonizing enterprise. So the first part of uh, this book deals with the post-war representation of empire the post-classical phase of the colonization is therefore examined through the representation of the colonized and the once colonized. Uh, applying post-colonial theories for the most part and often moving beyond theories articulated by Hart and Negri in, in Empire, in this book, scholars also scrutinize the relation between the colonizer and the colonized, and between metropoly and the colonies in uh, Maghreb, France, Australia, I India, England. So these uh, uh, relationships are closely examined. Um, in the next, uh, in part two, these so-called experimental nations that I mentioned before are uh, uh, examined. This term allows for the rearticulation of cultural heritage within the different schemes of imperial expansion. However, contributors also defy binarisms and thus move from the initial inquiry of the colonizer-colonized relationship to a more nuanced view that includes hybridity as well as racial and cultural metissage. Uh, oops. Um, which is very important. In the what I used to call the heroic era of postcolonial theories, there was this uh, obsessive insistence of this binary op opposition uh, of the colonizer and the colonized, and all these discourses that served this opposition, served and sustained this opposition. However, when we talk about postcoloniality, this um, binary opposition closes into a loop the, the discourses and will not allow us to come out of this, which means that we can repeat this ad nauseam how the uh, oppression of the colonized is assured by the colonizing discourse, uh, but we will not be able to go beyond that. And so I think with uh, observing and studying uh, the consequences of this colonial relationship, such as hy hybridity, racial, cultural metissage, we will be able to figure out discursive ways of uh, opposition and resistance which are not locked into this antagonic circle. Okay. Um, the articles, oops, where am I? Okay. The articles included in this volume further seek to demonstrate that inclusions in and exclusions from the realm of power are discursive and deliberate, as, in the, 
it is in the case of Caribbean, Puerto Rico, and Central America, which share unique racial and cultural pat patterns of hybridity that influence their political influences, sorry, their political positioning between the Americas. So uh, purposefully, we, we uh, came up with this title, Half of Empire, the Other America, which is, of course, an ironic uh, title, and this is how it should be understood. Uh, and the last section, which is, uh, oh God, something happened here. I have to go. It's missing a little bit. Here is the slide that I need. The last session, section, which is queering empire. The trope of intimacy, specifically sexuality, is explored in order to reimagine the colonized subject. Sexual metaphors have often been used to signify colonization, namely the male conqueror and the weaker female colonized. The representation of the queer, coloni queer colonized subject subverts this patriarchal image of colonization. Um, let's see where I go from here. No. <laughs> I am sorry to. Okay. All in all, interpreting uh, exemplary texts that delineate the distinct transformation in the concept of identity and culture, the articles in this volume review the transition from the colonial to the post colonial as a historical, imaginative, and narrative construct. Examples from the past and current empire building are thus analyzed from a transnational perspective by focusing on the exchange of ideologies and the practices of nation building, state power, democracy, and anti-democracy up to the recent war on terror so as to expose the roots of the emergence of empire and, the, and trace its continuum in the 20th century and beyond. The latter spectrum and coverage illustrates the undeniable fact that empire seeks to return all but in diverse form and with punctual justifications that are truly perennial. This is where the, the title comes from. Resistance to inequality uh, does not only come from ex-colonies, but it is also brewing in the home front, as these are not separate entities of the world. Uh, and I would like to recommend that you take a look at the Facebook page of Nova 99, which is a group that has been created by a few enthusiastic faculty members, and of which I'm a proud supporter. And please uh, check this out. And with this, I would like to close uh, this presentation. So the boring part is over, and I'm eager to have your questions or comments? Yes. Um, this might seem a little strange, but I just came here directly from uh, sitting in uh, for, a, for a professor showing the movie Gasland, oh, yes. which is a documentary about Probably. hydraulic factory and yes. the pollution. And, and, uh, Combining that with your presentation has made me think that maybe uh, uh, the perpetrators of, of hydraulic fracturing might be seen as colonizers in a similar way, except on a, on a domestic level. I, I know that uh, there's the story of the, uh, the Ecuadorian highlands, the, the Texaco story in the Ecuadorian highlands, where that's more of a traditional colonial model of a you know uh, neo-colonial entity going over it. Yeah. taking advantage of the basic resources, but now having that happening here on the home front. I don't know, do you have anything to say about the sure. possibility of that? Analogy? Being uh, married to a geologist, I am amply familiar with the gas land and with the uh, fracking uh, process. I don't know if you know that, but uh, in case you don't, there is this new idea of looking for oil uh, and gas in the earth, and this is horizontal drilling which could be a very good idea, but
but it is not because it has to be done in, in such way that in the meantime, while uh, gas is extracted, chemicals that are harmful uh, are injected into the soil and they find their way to the aquifer and thus uh, the water is uh, affected. So much so that in this movie you, you were able to see that some people open the faucet and is able to put a match and the water will actually produce flame. It was that the, the filmmaker would have been uh, writing back in the same way? Indeed, that yes. Every resistance to, to this um, hegemonic imposition of, of power, because economic power is still a power, and uh, resistance to, to the actions, but also to the discourses that justify this imposition, I think could be qualified as, as a sort of a similar to post-colonial resistance. You know, colonization is basically a word for the imposition of a structure, of a power structure with all its discursive and ideological um, framework. And so, yes, I, I would think so. Yes? Let me ask you a question about um, your, your um, term of hybridity. Okay, if you go to a country to colonize it and you go with a discourse and a language and a way of explaining things, I don't see a way of getting out of it, as you said. It's very, very difficult to get out of the colonized, colonizer way of looking at the world. And once the colonized start looking at it the same way and start using, using the same language, you are stuck with the colonized, colonizer. I don't see a way out. Tell me how. <laughs> Thank you for the question. It is really a wonderful question because I am sure that it, it occurred to many of you how to how to get out you know we have to recognize that for example in latin america spanish language was imposed uh, christianity was imposed uh, you know the whole feudal um, economic structure was imposed how do we get out of it and what does hybridity have to do with this right um <clears throat> think about the spanish spoken in spain in different places of spain which is also not a homogeneous entity. Latin America is much less so. And compare the language, uh, the way, the sounds, the vocabulary. It is a different Spanish, isn't it? Nowadays, we speak about a lot of uh, Englishes. We don't uh, keep the uh, elitist notion of that there is only one version of the language that is uh, acceptable. And this is what's happening with the religion uh, as well. You know, uh, religious uh, um, practices in Latin America have included a number of indigenous practices. And um, uh, what was the third one? Of course, the economic um, structures are, are very, very different uh, in Latin America for, by definition, because of the areas um, wealth and, and uh, wealth management and uh, all of these things. Now, hybridity, how does this come into the question? I would like to make um, a little risky uh, distinction between syncretism and, idea, uh, and hybridity. Syncretism is the fusion of two or more elements um, where the elements are recognizable in the sort of final product. Hybridity, however, comes up with a new element, I mean a new um, entity, new intellectual entity that is, um, that has elements from different um, origin, but it is new. It's not similar or not really um, exactly like either one of them. It's sort of a new thing. A good example, I think, that comes to my mind, it occurred exactly uh, in this country, is the Pachuco phenomenon. The Pachucos were in the 50s, uh, young people in California of uh, Mexican origin or Mexican-American origin, 
and uh, they were suffering from discrimination and racism, but not only on the part of Anglo-America, but also of Spanish Mexico, or, or Spanish-speaking Mexico, I should say. So they were not looked upon as acceptable or authentic by either one of these entities. And so they came up with this, uh, uh, with their own language, with their own culture, with their own uh, pretty outrageous dressing uh, code. And they created this pachuco, which was neither Mexican nor Anglo-American. It was something else. And so this is what hybridity does. Hybridity provides you a space from which you speak back, from which you create something that is not inherited, something that is new, something that will allow you resistance, that will allow you to say, here I am, and this is what I am. And it will give you a space of power from which to speak. That's uh, what I can say about it. Are these, to follow up on Mercedes's question, are these other spaces sustainable in the long term, though? I mean, within, with the economic realities of the world in which we live, I mean, ironically, in the European Union, for example, there's a lot of support from the empires to protect and to guarantee the, the existence going forward of these regional dialects and regional languages and cultures that otherwise would have disappeared under the hege hegemony. And yet, so in an ironic twist, uh, these other spaces are being protected financially and supported by the empire. Right? Yes, there is, there is some of this, obviously. And uh, this goes to many different directions. Um, because protection, on one hand, is very good because it saves a number of languages and everything. but. Do we, when do we talk about protection, which is in my view is a little bit of a, a paternalistic uh, attitude. Let me give you an example. It's, the, it's called La Escuela Lingüística de Verano. It's like a summer linguistic school. It's an entity born in, in Holland that uh, is an evangelist organization and it, uh, goal is to translate the Bible into all of the languages of the world, no exception. And they have gone to these very, very uh, elusive tribes in the Amazonian forest, in different places in the world, you can imagine. They were where nobody has ever set foot. Is this sort of a protective gesture, or is this a self-serving gesture, or is this some, because they did re um, rescue a number of these languages that we are talking about. Um, is this an inter not needed interference? You know, what, how do we evaluate these, these uh, gestures? So that's the, right. the million dollar question. Yes. Let me, let me ask a real abstract, uh, abstruse kind of question. It, it seems to me that, that the concerns of post-colonialism is really focusing on the problem of power, which of course is something which is near and dear to the heart of anyone who comes from political science. And, and so you've got this long tradition of trying to figure out what do you do with the problem of power? You mentioned Leviathan. Hobbes' solution was, well, give one guy unlimited power. He won't want any more power then, and he can actually do the right thing, which will be a surprise all of us. Or you've got the democratic idea. When I went to vote yesterday, I closed the curtain behind me so I can keep power out behind me. I can separate myself from power, and I can just act reasonably in my own self-interest. What's the solution that, that we're being offered to the problem of power here? I mean, one is resistance. I can resist power. but. Just give me the general, what's the solution to the problem of power? There's a quick, uh, a quick <laughs> answer for you. Well, if I knew it, I would be probably running for president. Uh, but uh, in any case, I cannot separate power from discourse. I'm a real Foucauldian in that sense, that there is this circle of power and discourse, discourse that sustains power and power that creates uh, the discourses. Power is definitely not something that you see manifested, you know, 
It's not the military that is the power. It's not the police that is the power. It's the discourses and the, this elusive, obscure power that sustains them, uh, which is tied to what we accept as truth. You know, because uh, truth is, as we know, it's not necessarily an objective truth out there somewhere in the middle of the table, but it's everybody's truth that you build to yourself and you believe that it is true or it is not true or it is mainstream or it is way out in the fringe. Depends on who we are. And so if we think about this idea of what we allow to happen in our house, in our neighborhood, in our country, in our world, that becomes the discourse uh, of power. Now, every discourse engages another discourse. I mean, there, there are players in every discursive situation, and all of these players have a certain amount of power. If you are talking back, obviously you have little power. If you are the one who is writing the laws, you have a lot of power. And that is not a merit-based system, you know. It is uh, something that we, we have to live with it. I don't think you can close the curtain. There is power in every little situation. You know, if you talk to your girlfriend or boyfriend, there is already power. Who loves you more? Who lo then there is power. Who is afraid of being left yeah. by the other person? I mean, this is a stupid and, and um, trivial example, but from this, we can go all the way to the uh, extremely funny and amusing Republican Democratic, uh, I mean, Republican uh, presidential debate. Where, where power is flaunted and, and all these cliches about uh, uh, the biggest or the most important country in the world are you know, uh, just thrown around like it was nothing. Go ahead, please. Early in your presentation, you said that colonization affects not only the country being colonized, but the colonizer. I'm wondering, if you can elaborate on that, did you mean it's it's influenced by maybe the diaspora that has gone back? Like I'm thinking of Ireland going over to England, or do you mean those people of the colonizing country who question their own identity? I'm thinking of authors like Conrad and Forrester who wrote about an empire from the colonizers. Um, yeah, about authors like who are questioning the colonial power, like uh, Conrad, like um, what is the guy from North Africa in France, very famous, La Peste, uh, Camus. 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 Okay, sorry, uh, Alzheimer is setting in. Uh, and so all of those people are definitely trying to engage in a discourse, but they are not really practicing post-colonial discourse because they are not necessarily um, condemning the colonial enterprise. They are uh, condemning certain aspects of it. Or, oh, you could be nicer to the colonizer, I mean to the colonized or to the indigenous whoever, you know, treat them a little better, that kind. Uh, I'm not um, specifically talking about Camus or Conrad in this sense. I'm trying to generalize it. But the first thing that you said is, is very interesting because the colonized is in our doorstep now. And uh, Stuart Hall, the, the cultural critic whom I rever revere, <laughs> uh, he wrote very interesting things about this. For example, if we think about great uh, European cities, Paris, London, if you travel on the metro or you go to the airport, or, what do you see? Do you see Frenchmen and, and the Englishmen? Well, you do see them, but they come in all colors, shapes, and forms, and, and uh, dresses. You know, if, if you see um, anywhere in the streets, uh, in any of these great European city, Europeanness today has a lot of different colors. It's not white, it's not pure, which is a, the obsession of, of modernity and the colonizing ideologies that were embedded in modernity. You know, it, it, is, it is all mixed, the difference is here. So 
we cannot really talk about colonizing countries anymore. It's all mixed. The diasporas, the, the, the migration. Today we, we are witnessing migration that has never been, um, uh, you know, it's, it's more than it has ever been before in terms of numbers and movements and, and this. So, thank you. Let it. Yeah, uh, actually, Mercedes and I were talking this morning, and she says something interesting, but I exercise my power to steal the, <laughs> <laughs> the point, which was we were talking about Italy, Spain, Portugal, Greece, you know, what was going on, um, especially in the light of the recent news about the Italian government, the interest rate being at 7%, the Italy being close to default, and we know Greece and Spain and Portugal are the problem too. So we were, I, I was, we, she was one. <laughs> uh, how can you, re do, can you relate that? You have a chapter on new modes of empire building. Is there, a, do you see a relation between an empire building with these Mediterranean countries? Are they going to be the new colonies in a way? And who is the, the emperor? Uh, yeah. yeah. I cannot answer this question, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Extremely informative answer I'm giving you. I've been thinking about that, and it has not been played out. So we are so much at the beginning of all this that I would be hard pressed to find an answer and to really say, okay, Germany and you know all those countries with money are going to call the shots and they are going to be the owners of everything. It seems that we are living in a century of so many surprises. I'm old enough to, to have seen the Berlin Wall fall. I never thought I would see that. I never thought I would see the so-called Arab Spring, you know. There are so many uh, surprises and power coming out of places that you don't expect it to, that I would really feel that I'm simplifying a very complex process if I say, okay, well, it's easier to say the, the South has always been sort of the bastard child of Europe anyway, so why not continue this trend? I don't know if this is true. I really don't know. Obviously, there, there are some power games being fought, but but even the holders of power, in this case Germany, I mean, she's in a squeeze like she has never been before, and Sarkozy the same thing. They, I mean, I'm talking about Merkel, of course. Because she herself doesn't know what to do. She's not controlling the situation, really. It's, it's Greeks, uh, little shenanigans that are controlling is, is there going to be a, a plebiscite or is there going to be a, what what they are going to do you know when when Papandreou uh, announced this uh, little game then everybody in in Germany I mean in the the government in Germany and France went <gasps> because they don't know what comes next and how it's going to what what can happen? Greece, in that case, if let's say the population says no to the European uh, package, what's it? They leave the European Union. They they uh, abandon the euro, and then they cannot abandon the euro. So they will keep printing the Greek euro, and everybody will go to Greece buy pocket loads of euro, cheap and then spend them in France or whatever. It, it's just mind-boggling what can happen if, if uh, you know, I have no clue how this crisis is going to be solved. But certainly it has to do with, with power and economic power. You know, it's um, speaking of the colonizer, OK, colonizer and the colonized, uh, do you think there can be an explanation from the things you've just mentioned about how um, in many countries, the, I don't know, but it seems like a lot of people are starting to see the colonizer as being internal and not a stranger anymore. So I mean, I, I, I just think it's interesting and I, 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 th I think there might be an explanation why, why this why this has suddenly happened, that people have been for long years thinking of the danger as being from like other countries that surround us and suddenly they started to look at their own country as a, as a, as a reason. 
This is an excellent question. Um, colonization doesn't necessarily know borders. You know, internal colonization is well known. Think about the Armenians and the Kurds in Turkey. Think about, um, you know, the, the Hutus and the Tutsis in Rwanda, all this stuff, you know, all these efforts. And the Alawites in Syria, why not? Uh, so um, it, it is, it is just the imposition of power. Much of this, I might add, has been created by classical colonizing powers. Because what happened? The British went to this uh, Middle Eastern area, you know, that includes Eastern Turkey, parts of Syria, parts of Iran, parts of uh, Iraq, and said, OK, here there will be a border. And in fact, the borders do look like this, like somebody drew a map in, I mean, a line in the map. And, and it just so happened that the Turks and the, I mean, the Kurds ended up in four different countries. And so they are uh, raising havoc and they want to have a different, want to have a country like everybody else. Uh, and so a lot of this has been um, created. The tensions today are in many instances created by uh, colonization. For example, talking about the Tutsi and the Hutu problems in Rwanda. It's been these, colon these games that the colonizers played at the time of colonization to play different groups against each other. Dividet impera, you know, that, that was the, that worked. And it still does, you know. And, and so I think that is definitely possible. Internal colonization is nothing new. Anybody else? Yes, go ahead. I was just wondering, um, on your last slide, the Nova 99, um, how does that, I mean, if you could explain a little more about it, because I personally don't know much okay. about it. So um, in addition to like how it ties into it is a, It is a group on Facebook uh, that has been created uh, in the library, Louisa Swinsky. I don't know how to pronounce her name, but it's something like that. She is extremely active, and uh, she uh, she's the most active member. Um, uh, Professor Karen Hollis and I were initiating members of this group. It's a Facebook group, and we do have events. For example, there is a, a wonderful seminar taught by Professor Anika Thiem in philosophy and somebody else whose name I can't recall right now. Unfortunately, this seminar is exactly this time when my class is taught uh, normally, and so I can't go, but that's something that you can go. If you go on the page, you will find a wealth of articles and information. Search for the group Nova99 on Facebook, and that's how you will be able. Um, I am not sure uh, what uh, we can do to grow because I was sort of hesitant to send it out to my students or to my uh, the graduate students or people that I have lists for because I feel that as a professor it's not necessarily my place to spread ideologies. So I was hesitant to do that. but I. I think that in a talk like this, it is appropriate to mention it because it relates to it. So uh, I think it would be the students who would have to start pushing this organization, and I hope that, that it will happen sooner or later. Yes? It has something to do with internal colonization, though, right? The same idea that you were just talking about? How so? Um, I don't know, the, the, the idea that there's a colonizing need somewhere within American society. Oh, you were talking about the... But well, didn't you ask how Nova 99 relates to the, the rest of the presentation? Oh, yeah, I see. And it's also my part of the question. Yeah, I see what you mean. Well, it is definitely a model of unequal relationships, you know, unequal power relationships, unequal economic relationships, and the the sort of uh, justifying discourses that go with it. For example, just the fact that when um, now, now it cannot be ignored, so finally it made it into mainstream television. It's mainstream, I say it always in a sort of mm, <laughs> way. <laughs> but uh, it, is, it is always mentioned in a rather sort of non-serious way that 
what are this bunch of hippies are doing there? You know, they are dreaming about the 60s and, and also they, they have so many different issues. What are they really protesting? We don't know. This is not true. This is in itself a marginalizing tactic, you know, because we do know what they are protesting. Yes, they are different things because these are different tentacles of this Leviathan that go into different directions. But I think the fact that a college graduate cannot get a job and some people's house was foreclosed, they are related, you know? They are not unrelated things. They are not unrelated, um, how do you say, reclamos, like? Complaints. Complaints, thank you. You know, they, they are related, but there are people who tend to, you know, there are so many ways of, of marginalizing discourses that are uncomfortable to us. You know, the mainstream itself, this word, is an example. Um, as we know, the mainstream encompasses something that is not very well defined, and everything else is considered deviant, or, or different, or worse, or whatever. Think about terms like communism, or, or um, you know, we don't really know what it is, we just know that it's bad, right? So, uh, these are, um, words that have been colonized in a certain ways because we don't really have the semantics of it. We just know that it's, it's not something that we want, right? Um, so I, I do believe that, that the discourses do marginalize and do colonize the mind of, of people. Colonization is sort of a metaphor for unequal power relationships. That's what it is. Anything else? Yes? I, mean, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the Arab Spring and, and maybe what we're going to see next. Um, because, right, it's so one, who knows? Because it's so, um, it was so inspiring to see these revolutions um, in uh, North Africa and um, in the Middle East. But then when you start looking, the first elections came through in Tunisia, and then you have these um, Islamist parties that, that rose to power, and Tunisia had one of the most, um, was one of those progressive societies for women in, in the Muslim world. So uh, you, sort of, like, you sort of wonder what's coming next. Um, and. Uh, of course, he liked Gaddafi, but then when you think about, you know, who who's going to be replacing him? I don't know whether he's. Good, I don't know whether the people replacing him are going to be much better. I mean, That's the hope, right? right? <laughs> but well, I feel that uh, talking about the Arab Spring, uh, the events is a little bit above my pay grade, but still, I'll intend to do that, especially having Lowell here. <laughs> it's sort of uh, he he knows far more about it than yeah, I do. However, I would like to say a few things. Of course, we all were delighted and we saw um, an interesting interaction, not just within the countries, but also with the so-called Western power, interfering in Libya, not interfering in Syria. You know, is it okay if people die in one country? Why is it not okay that if they die in another country? So this is not a sort of a gen genuine genuine yeah that's what I want to say not not really authentic ways of interfering for humanitarian reason but rather interest driven which you know you can't really judge that very harshly why would the country spend billions if it's not for in their for their own self-interest uh, the problem is when they start the moralizing discourse about it that's when you start going well yeah well maybe uh, as to the future I think the Islamist is the key word because it's very interesting. It is being framed in the discourses of this country and the other so-called Western powers. I really hate to use this word, but uh, because it homogenizes a very different interests and different places. Um, but I think, again, Islamism is like communism. We don't know what it is, but it's bad, and all of it is bad. So. We have to get rid of this idea because Islamism is going to be key because I think that a lot of young people who were in the, in the 
um, how you say, who embraced extreme forms of Islamism in the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s, because that was the only way out of this hopelessness that uh, they were living every day. You know, no future, no job, no hopes, no family, nothing. Uh, now, I don't believe that this brand of Islam is going to be flourishing uh, so long. I think the Islamists who are pragmatics by the, pragmatists, by the way, in many uh, areas of the world, they are realizing that participating in the democratic process will give them power much easier. And uh, I really believe that we will see a, de um, a more moderate form of Islamism emerging that will be participating in democratic processes. Of course, they'll push certain agendas, but you know, in, in um, li um, where? Tunisia, the Anahda party uh, leader, not yeah. Belhaj, something similar. I don't remember his name right now, do you? Yeah, okay. Um, he was saying that the women can wear bikinis on the shore, and you know, he was coming up with this stuff to show himself as a non-scary character. And I believe that this moderate Islamism is very important because why wouldn't they have it? Think about the Judeo-Christian ideological backing of the US and the many European countries. That's the cultural context. I mean, what else? Yeah, I understand that it's not homogeneous and there are Christians in Lebanon and Syria in a number of countries, but it is sort of, yeah, like there are non-Judeo-Christians in these countries and Europe as well, but the context itself is culturally Islam. So why wouldn't they emerge? That's what I can venture for the future. You know. Do you want to add something? <laughs> Anything else? Thank you so much for coming out.